You're listening to the Topco Business Unusual Podcast. Now, the Business Unusual Podcast. Learn from the greatest minds in business today. Interviews hosted by Ralph Fletcher. Learn how to improve business, get tips from industry leaders, and be motivated by real life experience. Topco. Business unusual. So welcome to this week's edition of uh, Business Unusual, Topco Media's podcast. And today I'm joined with an by an amazing woman. She's not just an amazing woman, she actually is the top woman, businesswoman of the year for 2022, Saliwe Ross, who's also the Director of Public Affairs, Group Strategy, Human Capital, and Sustainability at Old Mutual. Um, wow. Uh, firstly, congratulations for winning last year. I mean, okay. I saw I saw lots of uh, coverage and whatever, but I mean, how was that, firstly? And welcome, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ralph. And thank you very much for the recognition uh, to Topco Media and to Standard Bank as well. Standard Bank is a former employer. I think I spoke about it uh, when I won the award. So um, it was kind of like a homecoming in a way uh, for me. Um, yeah. And and humbling. These things always are. You know what, Ralph? I don't think, well, maybe some people do. I don't. I don't actually do these things for any level of glory. To be yeah. honest, it's too hard. <laughs> if it was just for the glory, I could do easier things. Um, it's complex. Um, it's a lot of pressure um, from a delivery and a and a time perspective. But I think when you're really passionate about what you do and you enjoy it, you just give it your all. And to be recognized for that is super humbling. And, and I mean, winning the award, has it changed anything for you or the organization or for, I mean, if you look back, has anything changed? Well, I got promoted. <laughs> so, um, so public affairs and sustainability was added to my portfolio um, like two months ago. Um, Congratulations. And at the time that I won the award, I was just running uh, group strategy and group human capital together. Uh, so the empire has grown. Uh, somebody sent me a message when I announced it and said, oh, Jesus, this global domination. I said either that or complete and utter madness. So I'm not sure which one it is. But yeah, I, I mean, I, my responsibilities have grown and I think it's partly recognition for that. Mm. Um and yeah, just for, I think from a network, not networking perspective, just people who've reached out, um, want to hear more. Um, it just gives, it's given a different um, uh, profile, I guess, um, external profile um, and accessibility as well, um, which has been, yeah, it's been very humbling, very pleasing. Yeah, I mean, I, I did see some of the posts, even from Old Mutual, and then I saw the comments below, and it wasn't a few. I mean, there was hundreds of these things. <laughs> And so even I was like, wow, this is it's truly amazing. I suppose when, you know, when we have the opportunity to choose, um, you know, these winners or the judges do, it, it, the reinforcement that you see through the public domain as well, because these things are publicly awarded, yeah. um, it's quite amazing. No, it really is. It really is. And it's, I think it's almost like it's, it's special to get that sort of feedback, particularly for people who, from people who work with you and for you whilst you're still alive to see it. I agree. Um, and it, like, there's a comment I remember that someone said who was saying it's like such great recognition for the superhuman effort you put in. And I was just like, okay, um, it's, it's, and I, I'm not saying superhuman is the reason. I'm just saying it's great to be recognized for the effort that one puts in. Um, and the passion that one exudes into these roles. They, you know what, Ralph, I, I don't say this facetiously, they can't pay you enough for some of no. these jobs. It's just, there's no way that I can sit back and say, actually, it's worth it financially, you know, with all yeah. the sacrifices. And I'm not saying I'm paid badly. I don't mean it like that. I'm just saying multi-millions of rands doesn't yeah. take away from the pressure, from the sacrifice, the time away, what you give energetically of yourself into your work. Yeah. And so you have to do it from a very deep place for it to be worthwhile. It's not about yeah. the money. It has yeah. to come from somewhere really deep within for it to be worthwhile. And where did that come from? Because, I mean, in your speech, which I watched again yesterday, by the way, mm -hmm. um, was amazing. I want to recite some of the things you said because you you, you thanked a whole lot of people. And, and it, 
And in a way, um, thanking Standard Bank and Topco, it, it's very gracious of you. And you mentioned your 10-year journey with Standard Bank, but you also thanked your father and your your twin sister. And you said, he said the words that he was disciplined and, um, and, he, and he grounded you. Yeah, I guess, and that's why I'm just so passionate about the cause for women. So my father was born into a very traditional baby family, North Sutu, and he only had two girls, two daughters, myself and my sister, and we're twins. Um, my mom was a nurse um, when they uh, got married and they, and they had us. And um, he, I think he kind of accepted the fact that I have these two girls, they're showing some promise academically. Like, what is our responsibility for them as parents? And my mom used to always say, like, your responsibility over your kids is two things. You must give them roots and you must give them wings. My mom was the roots, so values, respect, hard work, connectedness, family, all of those things are my mom's inputs and wings are my dad. So my dad just, he created an environment in our home where nothing was impossible. Um, and I never really perceived that I was a girl child um, who was mathematically gifted and pretty nerdy and wasn't doing the cool things until I actually got to university. Like being in a girl's school helped. But it was really until I got to university where we realized that both of us are engineers, my sister and I. Uh, it was the first time I realized there's a lot of guys in our class. Like, there's not a lot of us. I mean, up until matric, it was all girls. So it was all very comfortable um, and very equal, if I was to call it that. So it didn't seem like anything weird or unique until we got to university. But that's like that's a that's an environment that my dad created. And he also protected us a lot from other things. You know, he was very strict. Yes, he was very firm. Uh, we weren't allowed to go to parties and sleepovers and stuff. He wanted us to be focused, but he also allowed us to determine our way. I don't think he would have had a problem if I had decided to go and study music, which I did study up until matric. I took music as a subject. He, I don't think he would have had an issue, you know. Um, both of us were very arty, so we both sang in the choir and did public speaking and played in the orchestra. So there were a number of things. Um, and his big thing was just open up those opportunities and both he and my mom sacrificed a lot as people to make us who we became. Um, and so of, oftentimes when I speak about my family of origin, I always say, I believe my sister and I are parents' wildest dreams come true. Everything that we've achieved is more than what they perceived was possible. Um, and that's a great place to be. For sure. And and obviously the success is not just previously for your mum and dad, but obviously it's the partnership you've created. And, and it's funny because in your speech, you, you mentioned something profound, but Warren Buffett said the same thing. He talks about investing and being successful. And he says the best investment, the best decision you can make is the partner you marry. Oh, yes. I say that to all women. So I say the biggest career decision you will make is choosing your life partner. And that's whether and it's whether you want to work or not, whether you want to be an executive or not, that's a career decision. So if you decide, I want to uh, get married, I want to uh, maybe work for a few years, but once I have kids, I want to stop working and dedicate my whole life to my children. That's a career decision. If you decide, I want to go and do, uh, go and do an MBA in the US, I want to be a listed company executive, I want to become all these things, that's a career decision. Find the guy who is going to support you in that. Don't think that he's going to change intramatrimonially all of a sudden and decide, actually, it's okay. You can stay home or actually go and pursue that big dream. Let's go to the U.S. Let's move for you to go to Harvard. I'm okay. I'll watch the kids. Like contract for that stuff at the start. Um, mm. and I've Contract that at I've the had, start. Yeah. I've had failed relationships. So I know that it can go wrong, but it's my biggest acknowledgement of my husband, Andre. Andre is an executive in his own right. Um, he's an MD at a bulge bracket investment bank. Um, so he works hard, but he doesn't value or perceive his hard work as, as any different to mine. And mm. so our contribution into our home is equitable. It's not equal. Mm. It's equitable according mm. to our strengths and according to our passions. And according to how we agree, we will contribute. Um, we both contribute financially, but it's about all the other things that take up time and energy and how we share those responsibilities. I do kids' homework. I'm better at it. Um, and I'm more committed to it. He does kids' extramurals. He's more into sport. He's more into, like, how do we grow that part of it? You know? Um, and, and I think, like, us playing to our strengths is the thing that keeps us going. And we're very dedicated about our time versus their time. 
Um, it's a mm. thing that keeps us sane. Uh, we're dedicated to date nights. Uh, we close off Friday, Thursdays at 5 p.m. religiously unless we're traveling and then it becomes Friday. Um, and everybody knows, my team knows, my PA knows it's date night. I don't take calls. I don't check emails. It's just our time to connect during the week and just have a conversation with our kids, with our bosses, with our phones, with our, our two companies that take up a lot of our time. And we're also super dedicated about taking breaks without our children. We take breaks with them. Of course we do, but we need our time too. Um, away from our home, away from the various distractions. And it's not easy to do, Ralph, not with our jobs and not with our life. So we have to be super dedicated about it. But that's a decision. It's a conscious decision we've made. It's a commitment we have to each other. And it's not always simple. It's not always as neat as I put it. And anyone who's married would probably agree. But you just have to be super intentional about it. You just have to keep on putting in the work. And year by year, you see yourself getting there. And our kids know, like, that's our first relationship. It's God first, and then it's us, and then it's you guys. And we have to be intact because they're going to find their lives, right? They're going to find their life partners. They're going to go off to university. And then it's just us. And I don't want to look back and be like, who the hell are you? <laughs> like, let's let's get to know each other again. So that's been a very conscious decision, yes, on my part, but I think on both our parts. It's amazing, eh? Yeah, I mean, I think we celebrated our twenty fourth anniversary the other day, so I, I know what you mean. It's it's we. I did something slightly different. I I looked at the different roles I played, and I had goals for those different roles that I play, and then I had some vision boards around it. And again, it was all the things you're saying: date night, time away, time with the kids, time for yourself as well. And then you obviously got your job, but but your role is. I mean, your career role is really, really interesting because you talk around these different decisions and the yeah. discipline. But it, starting with engineering, you you worked at BHP Billiton, and and then you there, there's like this change. You studied all that time, and I'm fascinated with leaders who are committed, who who study, they go into a career, and then they let's use the the covid word pivot um <laughs> but i mean th there's a lot of challenges with that fears the unknowns mm. and you seem to have done this several times what's with that yeah i think that it's easier to connect the dots looking backwards at the time that it was happening i yeah. probably wasn't as conscious of it as i am now so i think what i recognize in myself is i've gotten super comfortable with not knowing it's, it's a okay. big leadership trait of mine. And I think because I don't know, like, I don't know anything about sustainability. I don't know anything about HR. I don't know anything about strategy. I didn't know anything about investment banking when I transferred from mining to investment banking, nothing. I didn't even know it was a discipline. Um, I didn't know anything about executive search when I moved from the bank into Egon Zen. I had no idea. But I've realized over time, actually, that I feel like one of my personal superpowers is being comfortable with not knowing. I didn't know how male dominated the mining industry was. I didn't know the amount of physical strength you actually need to, to run a mine. That's why men do it. Uh, we're built differently. Um, they can shovel more uh, coal. They can push uh, heavier things. They can lift heavier things. They can throw further. They can, it's just a, it's a biology thing, right? Um, and even when I decided to study engineering, it's an interesting story, actually, because my sister and I went to a WITS open day. We both went to WITS University and we both knew we wanted to study engineering. My mom dispelled any dreams of studying medicine whatsoever. She was a nurse and she was just like, guys, you really don't want to do this. And she took us to one of her ICU shifts and that did it. I decided I was never going to follow a career in medicine. Um, but being mathematically inclined, et cetera, engineering was a good choice. My sister's a civil engineer. <coughs> And she's still a civil engineer today. Um, she is blessed and fortunate to have found her life's calling and career early. At the age of 18, she just knew that's what she wanted to do. We walked into the School of Civil Engineering, and I remember Setu's eyes just lit up, lit up. Like she was like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to build, et cetera. And that's what she does even today. Um, I knew I wanted to do engineering, didn't know which one. I was kind of mulling around, et cetera. And I bumped into mining engineering purely by accident. I didn't even know it existed as a discipline. And said, okay, I'm going to sign up. 
I'm sure my mom almost passed out when I made this announcement when we came back from the open day because I left home saying, oh, I think mechanical engineering is the one. And then I came back and I was like, nah, it's mining. And she was like, did you say mining like underground? I was like, yeah, mining. It was so cool. Like I, I enjoyed the people, et cetera. But there's a lot I didn't know. Um, and as I was studying, obviously it, it became clearer to me. And even when I was studying mining engineering, I knew for a fact that I didn't want to run a mine. That wasn't my destiny. It's not what I was passionate about. And many of the lessons I learned working underground with men my dad's age um, has stood me in good stead with everything I've learned today. And I think it's just the power of not knowing. I didn't know. Um, so firstly, just from a safety perspective, when you work underground, your safety is not just your own. The team's safety really matters. Mm -hmm. And so I always say to teams that I work with, no one individual is ever more important than the team. I'm very happy to separate with you if you think you're more important than the team. It's okay, but I don't work with individualistic people. The team matters. So valuing the team really matters. And I learned that underground mm -hmm. because your life relies on the actions and reactions of the people around you. And so does theirs on what you do. So just learning mm -hmm. why teams are important, I learned it underground. Yeah. Learning the power of, like, when I say engagement, I'm not talking about engagement surveys. Like, when there's no water or there's no air or electricity, you're forced to sit and have very deep conversations with people while you wait. Yeah. You can't go out. So, yeah. like, really getting to know people, getting to know what drives them, and understanding that there are common things that unite us as humanity that aren't always obvious, but they are there. So these were men well, who were well into their 50s. Many of them had never completed primary school, let alone high school, you know, coming from rural areas. By all accounts, they were all very different to me, let alone yeah. gender. They were just very different. But in hearing their stories, in understanding their context, I just, you find the common threads. And it's like, this is what unites us. This is what makes us a team. This is what makes us a people. And it's, a, it's lessons that I've taken forward with me throughout my career. I hold them in very high regard even today. But it came really from not knowing and not, not appreciating quite how difficult this was all gonna be and different it was gonna be. And it was in the middle of nowhere. So I was forced to rely on people. And I think when you don't know, you're forced to rely on people. So mm. knowing what good quality people looks like, knowing what great performance looks like, how to build a good culture, how to drive performance, how to coach one-on-one, -on -one, one to many, how to build that sort of relationship and interrelationship in your team, those are all like the things that are now playing out that I feel foundationally were built in a small section at, at uh, Two of Fontaine Mine in Steelput with, with a number of guys in my section. So being comfortable with the unknown, it's quite a big thing because people have degrees and they get comfortable with knowledge and um, or experience even. And so if that's your superpower, can you share with us what the what the process is for some people who are challenged with that? Because there are many people who are the opposite, who fear it. So what is it that you do when you go into these situations where there's unknown, where you've got this new opportunity now, where you've got new roles that you've got to take on that you've got very little knowledge? Is there a process that you go through in terms of, right, this isn't a problem because I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Is it asking questions? Is it looking for mentors to help you? What, what are the sort of things that you do to, to get comfortable? Yeah, it's a number of things. So I do reach out to mentors and people who I respect who are doing what I've been asked to do um, and, and just seek their counsel. Uh, tell me about it. Help me understand it. What have you done? What do you think great looks like, et cetera? I also read a lot. A lot. Mm. And I read widely. Mm. Unfortunately, like I don't read um, uh, nonfiction books. Sorry, I read a lot of nonfiction um, biographies. Mm. Um, yeah. I read a lot of articles, Harvard Business Review and McKinsey podcasts. And podcasts have been a lifesaver for me. I, like there's so many people I follow. And if I'm going for a walk or something, my earphones are in my ears and I'm listening to something. If not, then I'm listening to a book. Audible yeah. is one of my best friends. So I read very widely <laughs> with lots of variety. Um, and that's what's kept me challenged and interested in different things. And I seek counsel and advice. And I've kept mentors. You know, the people I mentioned in my thank you speech are people that are yeah. in my life even today that I could still reach out to and say, hey, I need to chat. I might not see them for two, three, four years. But if I reached out and said, hey, let's have a coffee. I need some advice. Yeah, They would make the time and I would make the time for them. For so sure. I think mentors... 
counselors, whatever, that really matters. Yeah. Uh, two, I think exposure. And I, I think if somebody feels like they fear change, the only way to get over that fear is to expose yourself to more of it. Like keep dipping your toe into the next big change and then it, it will become a foot and then it'll become your whole leg. Very soon you'll be able to immerse yourself in that change because mm -hmm. the world is changing at such a rapid pace. If there's something that we cannot stop from happening, it's change. And mm -hmm. so being comfortable with that uncomfortableness, I'm not saying I'm not uncomfortable with it, Ralph. I yeah. am uncomfortable with it, but I'm not scared of it. Yeah, yeah. So you know it's going to be uncomfortable, but you're okay with that because you know the discomfort, if you don't, is going to be and way worse anyway. And and I was going to ask, like sort of, I also read a lot and um, watch a lot of podcasts, obviously, and all that sort of thing. I mean, what do, you, what, what do you recommend for leaders to read at the moment? Are you got any favorites you're sort of reading at the moment that you're They're, getting your attention? The best, the best leadership read I've read of this year is a book called CEO Excellence. Um, yeah. It's written by a number of McKinsey partners. And what I've enjoyed about that book is it lays out in chapters the big, um, what would I call them, kind of thematic decisions or thematic themes that CEOs need to look out for. But it doesn't just talk about profit. It yeah. talks about how to design your organization. It talks about mm -hmm. how you build an operating rhythm, particularly for those of us who work for large, complex, listed entities, you have to create a level of certainty and that comes yeah. in operating rhythm. So people know we're here. This is what's coming next. This is what's coming next. It talks about how to manage a board, how to manage external stakeholders and regulators. It talks about having community impact from a CEO's lens. And they interview a number of CEOs around the world. It's one of my greatest reads. During COVID, a book that, yeah, it was just mind blowing for me to read is a book by Jeff Immelt called um, Hot Seat. Uh, okay. Jeff Immelt was the outgoing CEO of GE. He took yeah. over GE from, from Jack, Jack Walsh, Walsh, who was the CEO of the century, who was like everything that was <laughs> iconic about a CEO of a company was Jack Walsh. And two days into Jeff Immelt's tenure, 9-11 happened. And so his opening, what got me in the book as I read it in, in, in uh, lockdown was in his opening, he says, by all accounts, I'm a failed leader, right? GE was destroyed. It had to be broken up. It's a shadow of what it was in the early 2000s, and I presided over that. So by all accounts, I'm a failure. So why am I writing this book? Why should you read it? And he actually places a challenge on you as the reader to say, what would you have done? With everything I knew and the cards I was dealt, what would you have done if you were me? And it's such a powerful book. <laughs> it's deeply vulnerable, as, as vulnerable as an American CEO can be, <laughs> but it is yeah. vulnerable. Um, yeah. And it's an amazing account of the complexities and the challenges of the roles at the top of large organizations. Mm -hmm. It is so real. It is so raw. It is so rough. Um, yeah. And I think people who aspire to that level of work, those are the types of books they should read. For sure. I'm reading um, Whitey Besson's book. I just finished it. Have you read it? I've got it. Freaking good book, eh? Really, okay. really, really good book. And I think that um, he's also a bit of a nuts and bolts guy. He gets in there, gets dirty with things. And I think it's inspiring, actually, to see that that level of involvement that he had. Um, but, I mean, talking about Jeff and, and the CEO book, there must be a number of challenges that you're faced with with these new roles and the complexity of doing business in Africa and moving away from South Africa to making these strategic decisions. Is there anything you got from those books that you, you you've been able to apply within what you're doing at the moment? Lots, <laughs> everything, <laughs> um, everything. I'm convinced that as organizations, there are very few problems that we're trying to resolve that are unique mm -hmm. to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so it's just helped. Sometimes it just helps me feel like I'm not crazy. Um, so yeah. I'm not dealing with this on my own, but also yeah. has given me like arsenals and tips on how to maneuver or navigate in some of these things um, from people with very different perspectives. So, um, you know, from an old mutual perspective, it might be pan-African growth, but for G it was global, but still, you yeah. know, dealing with different cultures, even uh, the, the, the CEO of Disney also wrote a great a book and when you read like the growth story of Disney um, into into various markets it's just fascinating um, and so I've learned a lot about that cultural assimilation um, that that operational cadence and uh, and rigor is has been a big takeaway for me um, yeah. you can't leave anything to chance and so being able to create a level of 
it's not certainty, it's clarity. Like, I just don't believe we can yeah. give people certainty anymore. Um, yeah. And what trumps certainty is clarity. And how would you define clarity? Just where are we going and why are we going there? Yeah. And how will we know when we're there? Okay. And is that is that difficult at the moment or are you finding it easier? No, <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It, it's yeah. tough. Um, just because so much is changing. I, if I think about the impacts of generative AI, just when we thought you'd figured out blockchain yeah. and cryptocurrencies, here comes yeah. generative AI, there'll be something else. There'll be something else. And when you work in a people intensive business, you know, we, we sell the problem solving and idea generating capacity of people. That's what we sell. We don't sell widgets and things. It's really the ability for our people to solve problems and to sell ideas. And, and so when you work in that IP heavy type environment, these changes are very real. Yeah. They're visceral for people. They, the, the context within which they operate is changing and their jobs are changing too. Because the problems that they were being asked to solve are changing. And so they have to adapt very quickly with that as well. I notice in your LinkedIn introduction, igniter of passion in people. And and then you go on to say how great company culture delivers awesome business results. But I mean, talk to me about that because igniter of passion in people. Because I mean, I think for many years we looked at organizations, certainly I did, as like great marketers, or maybe they're great at logistics, or maybe they and then you realize, hold a second, an organization is a number and uh, digits, like that's the organization, but it's made up of people. It's the people. It's not It's not the company that comes up with innovation. It's the people that come up with it. It, it sounds so cliche. It all comes down to people, particularly mm. in financial services. But I'd argue, <clears throat> excuse me, in all industries, it comes down to people. people. Your employees interface with customers. They interface with shareholders. They interface with the communities in which we operate with. They interface with regulators. They are the face, the hands, the heart, the feet of the organization. And so mm. when I said that, like I didn't mean it lightly, I believe that the role of a leader is to ignite passion. It's yeah. how you unlock discretionary effort. Yeah. And you can only ignite passion when you understand what truly drives someone. It's like, yeah. what is it that gets you going? What makes you jump out of bed at night? Are you a family person? Are you a sports person? Are you an extreme sports person? Are you a, you know, I'm, I'm giving those examples uh simplistically because when you understand what drives people and you know what they're passionate about and you can connect their passion to what they have to do at work like the results are amazing i, I yeah. in my job ralph i see the best of people and the absolute worst of people <laughs> the things that you're just like he did what she said what you know <laughs> it, it will shock you the things that people can do at work but the best part is when you see people like unleashed it is the mm. thing i love most about my job mm. So, I mean, you, it's true, though. I think that there's that, that sense of personal accomplishment and then you see someone else thriving. And I don't know what it is, but it just gives you that that inner smile that to see someone grow and go above what they even thought they were capable of. Even that yeah. might have been tough because most change is not easy, but it is rewarding, eh? Yeah. Change is not easy. And the only way that you get people through it is is to ignite passion in them, is, is to help them unlock that discretionary effort because it's tough. And oftentimes we're asking people to, to pull through very difficult things. Yeah. You know, during COVID, um, and it's such a simple thing that we did, outside of the big things that we did, Old Mutual did a lot during um, COVID. You know, we um, we set aside uh, funding and cover, like uh, insurance and health cover for frontline workers, and they could claim at no cost, we, we funded the whole thing. Um, and those are super, super powerful things that an organization can do. But um, for employees specifically, one of the things that we did was we created an Exco blog and it had okay. pictures. Uh, many of us were obviously in our homes, so sharing what we were doing, sharing recipes. Uh, we had a ghostwriter who happens to also be on Exco and she's particularly gifted in, in humorous writing. And yeah. what it did for people was, hey, these guys are, they're human. They're, they're just like us. They're dealing with exactly the same things. Uh, you know, one of my favorite things I remember or yeah, in one of the blogs was, I, I think homeschooling has taught me that um, 
I can understand why some animals eat their young. Like it's it was hard. It was so hard for me to watch all my kids. Very difficult getting them to focus, getting them to stay engaged. They were on a screen. It was really hard. So, and people were just like, I hear you, like laughing about it. But yeah, this is my challenge. This is what's happening. I just think it humanized Ian, our CEO. It humanized us as an executive team because people just saw the same things that are happening in my house are happening in his house or her house. And we're all grappling with the same things and we're all just trying to, to connect, you know? And, and that's what I mean about finding that place of passion and being able to connect on a very human level. There's all this these tag words that people are using now, like bringing the humanity back to the workplace. And I suppose it's the challenge that generative AI is bringing. But ultimately... Like, that's what I learned working underground. Like, we're just yeah. people. All of us have dreams for our kids, dreams and passions for ourselves, desires for for being able to become more than, than what we are today. Um, and once you're able to find that in people, like, I just think you, yeah, you can win. And and even as you mentioned earlier, like, those were the heartwarming responses, certainly from Utilites, um, when the announcement of my award was made, was just how many people who were like, we've, you, you've become like the heart of our organization. Um, and I believe very much that that's important. I believe all leaders should should form the heart of an organization, like truly the heartbeat of the organization. People should feel connected to you, not as this person with this big job, but as a person, as a human being, uh, connected yeah. to what it is that you do and why you're passionate about doing it and why you need them to do it with you. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's true. Eh? you you, you got to have that inspiration for others. I looked at some of the roles that you you did at Standard Bank. Then I looked at where you went into looking for key talent and leadership. And then you moved from managing projects, infrastructure in the rest of Africa. And then you went, went into this chief of staff sort of role. And now I see you taking on strategy, sustainability, public affairs and I and I can't help but wonder what's the what's the thread what did you learn that's brought around this success is it that you realize in these infrastructure projects that you were funding that it was people that were center of it and 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 growing the chief of staff you saw how important the people were and then the execution was easy yeah um, I, I, I definitely think it's that, Ralph. It's just bringing it down to people, bringing it down to what people do that matters, matters to them, matters to the organization. The sweet spot is when you can meet both. And it's not everything that intersects, but there has to be that sweet spot. And I don't think that the company's purpose must be your purpose. I don't believe in that. I just believe that when we're very clear about what your own purpose is, find the company that helps you unlock that. Mm. Do the work that helps you unlock that. And then you'll 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 jump through walls, like you'll do amazing things um, once you find that. And I mean, we spoke about the future now. You know, we've both got children. We've, we've had a hybrid type environment. We've we've mm -hmm. got the future of work. How's that I mean, from a strategic a human capital? How, what is What are your thoughts on, on this? Because I think, you know, I look at my kids, they think differently to me. There's no two ways about it. And, you know, I'm like old school, I'd say that. I'm like old school. I've got certain principles that I definitely believe in. And, yeah. like, I like coming to work every day and meeting people and engaging and feeding off them and getting ideas. What, but what are your thoughts? Because you're dealing with, it's not just a South African. You, you're looking at a global operation. You're in Africa. You yeah. know, there's no ways that people can come all to the same office. So that... Yeah. That so, reality is sort of not the same for, for you. No. Look, I, I think that the world has moved on from five days in the office. We have to accept that. Um, the voice of employees and the preference of employees has come front and center. And that's not a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have to welcome it. Um, but I do think that what companies need to resolve, and I, when I speak to my peers around the world, not just in South Africa or Africa, around mm -hmm. the world, this is the problem that we're all trying to resolve is how do you return people to the office meaningfully? Why do they need to come back to the office and how do you connect them to that? Because the thing that you mentioned, Ralph, are the things why people need to come into the office. It's for connectedness. It's mm -hmm. to build culture. It's to feel included. It's to mm -hmm. grow. And mm. it's to have those chance meetings, like even execution and delivery is so much easier when you can quickly find the people who you need rather than mm. organizing a team's call and you get there, et cetera. My biggest worry is with any level of remote work is for two people. 
the first people are people who are new to your organization, mm. irrespective of their level. They're new. They're walking into mm. old mutual. They never walk into your doors or corridors. They don't know who you are. They don't know what good looks like. They don't know what works where, who does what, etc. How do you get those people to feel firstly like they belong? Yeah. Secondly, that they understand. They understand the work that they have to do. They understand what good looks like. And thirdly, that they are enabled to deliver what they need to deliver. So that's new people. Sure. My second concern is for, for people who are new to the world of work. So your first five years of work, mm. how are we sure that we're tooling these people correctly? I fear that we're going to come in three years' time and look up, come up for air and be like, what can these people do, actually? Like, what's their skill? Those are the two things. So irrespective of the number of days you can do your productivity analysis or whatever, my worry is just for those two cohorts of people. Yeah, I think I think that if you look at the young people, and let's talk about them first quickly, they're so endowed with technology skills, they have the opportunity to mentor older staff in terms of how to use AI, how to use these technologies to become more efficient, productive in a way that we would be challenged to do because they make it seem easy. And I think that they have a massive role to play in upgrading, educating us in those habits, in the way that they do it so easily to be able to see, actually, it's fine. It's easy to do. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and I agree with you. I think that the, the interactions of people, innovation, is it's not something that's forced. It's just something when you bring two people together, when you bring three people together, wow, you, you I mean – that's what a like, mastermind is. Success comes yeah. from not from an individual. It's when you you bring two people together. Exactly, exactly. And it, that, it, that's the that's where human ingenuity comes into play. Like I find on these calls, yes, you start, you greet, a little bit of pleasantries, you get straight into work. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, if we're really passionate about, like, for me, igniting passion in people is very difficult to do online. Yeah. It's very difficult to do. We yeah. and building connection, coaching people. And by coaching, it's mm. like, like, how do I say to Rolf, here are the things I expect from you? Here's yeah. what I see that's going well. Here's what I think is challenging. I can see this is challenging you. How can I help you get there? Yeah. So it's not just about that once a year performance conversation that says, here's your performance rating, therefore mm. here's your bonus, if, if that's how it mm -hmm. works in your org. It's really about mm. continuously through the year. Mm. how do I have those conversations where somebody understands, even if they understand it and they realize, oh, the gap is big. Mm. I'm not where I need to be. I need help. I'm struggling. Mm. Mm. Um, it's very hard to do online. It's very hard to do online. Yeah. I, I think there's a saying, isn't it? It's called reading the room. And one of the things I noticed when it's online, a lot of the cameras are off. You don't see the reactions. Oh. I can see someone's having a bad day. Out Also, after the meeting might, might be fine. But afterwards, you can see they're maybe having a bad day. There's a challenge. They're feeling stressed. You're not mm -hmm. going to pick that stuff up if it's online. Mm -hmm. someone, someone said something to me a little while ago that kind of surprised me. And it was almost a bit, a bit like the power is with companies and corporates in terms of employees. And I had this almost revelation looking at what's happening in employment and jobs and talking around the unions. And I almost felt, because you, you kind of said that, listen to the voice of the employees, but I think the tide has shifted. If there ever was a time when the employers had control or were in charge, I think it's shifted to the employees now. And uh, without a doubt, I mean, and, and the people with the perception that you need, I, I think the free market would dictate this unions and those sorts of, you know, lots of legislation. I think with people with skills, people with good abilities, they will dictate in, in fact, what they want and what they need. So Ralph, my twin sister is a civil engineer, as you know, and she challenges everything that I think about employment and careers, et cetera, given that I work in HR primarily along with all these other things. So she's a full-time gig worker. She manages construction projects all over the world from home. Um, and she they use satellite technology and obviously these sorts of tools, et cetera. The first time I saw a digital assistant was with her. So the digital assistant sends her minutes of her meeting, gives her an analysis even of sentiment, who spoke more, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she deals with her foreman on various sites through, she can see through those satellite imagery how they're progressing from a construction perspective. She's able to step in and say, guys, materials are running out here, order more, do this, divert this crew here, et cetera. 
she works across different time zones as a result. So she can work in Australia. She can work on the West Coast of the U.S. She does work in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. She's never physically met any of her clients, ever. So it just, so I realize that, like people can dictate terms. She she works mm. globally. Um, mm. She doesn't need a visa. She doesn't need a tax jurisdiction. She doesn't need an employment contract. She doesn't need a dust-up. Like all the things that you would think are normal. She doesn't expect benefits from them. Look, she's married. So her husband does, takes care of those sorts of things. Um, like from a medical aid perspective. So that's a position of privilege. I get that. But all I'm saying is she's building a meaningful career from her home with a number of um, international clients. It it boggles my mind that this is possible. For sure. And and I mean, talking about your sister and about you, I mean, you, you are very pro-Africa and opportunities here and the people in Africa. I mean... Yeah. I mean, what do you see as the future of Africa and the and the, and its people? I mean, yeah. so again, I'm going to first start with my my dad um, wasn't was the ultimate Afro optimist. Um, okay. He taught himself how to speak Swahili, um, and he he understood the origins of language. So he was very passionate about language. I speak I don't know nine languages or something like that. Wow. Um, so he was very passionate. <laughs> Like get to know how to when you can greet someone in their home language, it lowers the barriers. They feel connected to you, etc. So he was very big on that, and very big on us getting out. So I never had the parents who were like, "No, you can't go to school far away. You can't go to varsity far away. Stay here." It was like, "Go, oh, go and see, go and experience for yourself." Um, my sister is married to a Namibian, and they've lived all over the African continent, um, West Africa, East Africa, in Namibia, in South Africa. Um, that's partly why her career is the way that it is, in fairness, is because she's had to move around a lot. Um, but I see, what I see in my nieces, so my sister has two daughters, what I see in my nieces is a worldliness that you can't get from reading. The mm. world is so accessible to them in their minds and their hearts because they've either met someone from there, they've been there, whatever. Like, it's it's just, it's it's accessible in a very practical way. And they kind of see themselves as citizens of the world rather than as citizens of Namibia. Um, yeah. So that matters. Um, at a point, my mom was in South Africa. I was in Ghana with my family. My sister was in Tanzania with her family. And she was doing that triangular trip all the time so she could see the grandkids and spend time with us as well. And her friends used to be like, oh my gosh, isn't it hard for you? Like, your daughters aren't close to you. They're in these far away, far flung countries. And she was really like <laughs> encouraging, but also sharing the practicalities of how awesome it has been for her like what she has learned from the different cuisines to, I remember when I took my mom on the slave route in Ghana and standing at that point of no return, it's like an archway that you stand through. And you can imagine these slaves that were walked through there to go to, to, to America. And she was crying just standing there because it becomes so visceral, it becomes so real. Oh. You can read about it, you can, you, can, you can research it, but when you're standing there, it's so different. And she just chose to focus on that. Yes, we were far. Yes, we didn't have Sunday lunches together, but there were these experiences that she got to have that that I think other her peers weren't necessarily having, weren't mm -hmm. having. And so it is real. Like it's for yeah. me, um, like I, I don't want to say the bug has bitten, but I just feel like we have such a responsibility to represent our continent positively. It's yeah. not without its challenges. South Africa is not without its challenges. The rest of the continent is not without its challenges. So I'm not asking for us to put blinkers on. But I think that as Africans, we've got such a huge responsibility to share the stories of our continents and to share the positive outcomes of our continent. I believe that sustainability and climate change can be our biggest opportunity if we take it on as a continent. It is the yeah. thing that unlocks our youthful market, our youthful population, creates a very new market. We have the largest amounts of um, coastline that can be exploited for renewable energy. We have the largest amounts of arable land. Politics is our challenge. Borders are our challenge. I get it. But the opportunities are there. Yeah. And, and how do you see other organizations uh, like you going into Africa and, and taking up these opportunities? Because I think there there are so many and, and we're seeing it with like private equity, how much private equity into tech, fintech, those sorts of things is just exploded, actually. But also the returns and they're coming back and, and more people are getting involved because of the huge levels of returns. And it's almost like even with the risk built in, they're still getting better returns than they would in any other continent. 
Yeah, I think that's particularly for South African companies. My only caution is don't go into it with South African tinted passes. Mm. What works here doesn't necessarily work in the rest of the continent. It's to take time to understand the local context um, and not think that you can just copy and paste what happens in South Africa there. Also, people, they actually get fundamentally offended by it when we show up that way. Um, mm. And I think they appreciate it more when they feel not only consulted and involved, but appreciated. Uh, we are in the process of expanding our technological capability at early stage. So what we do for grads and early stage career people in technology, just because it is such a critical skill set across the world. And we want to establish tech hubs in places across the continent that we know are better than South Africa. And you have to recognize that they're better in order to make that decision. Mm. And, and sustainability, because it is a big issue at the moment and obviously one of your broader layouts. But I mean, I mean, we, we spoke earlier about the cause for concern. You had challenges with your wind where you had trampolines in your estate moving. I mean, down here in, in the Western Cape, we had floods and <laughs> swells and rising <laughs> tides was you know in gordon's bay and victoria bay that were like shared on the internet i mean it, it, so, someone said to me that today no the uk is actually good because we had had no major catastrophe this year in terms of um weather so in fact the the weather in the uk is really good this year but i mean how much of an impact is that on someone like old mutual and your future thinking Oh, it's huge. I mean, especially if you think of our short-term insurance business. So the business that insures cars, homes, um, and commercial assets, uh, these significant weather events have a big impact on risk, on risk appetite and the cost of, of insuring those assets. But the opportunity in it is starting to be able to model climate risk is the next wave. There's the, that's the new career. Um, that has yeah. to be built um, and the predictive analytics behind it. I also think like the great opportunity once you get that right is you can start to build responses that are appropriate for communities once you understand from a modeling perspective where is there the likeliest risk for the next earthquake, the next big fire, the next big flood. Mm. It allows corporates to show up in a more responsible way with data informing their decisions. So it's an opportunity. It's complex. It's tough. Um, yeah. But it's a space that we definitely see ourselves playing in um, and in starting to understand climate change risk uh, and building that capability, particularly in arterial and, and data folk. Um, yeah, that's a big focus. It's interesting because eh? I actually saw something in the mining where they had the engineers um, looking looking at different areas where you could have oil in the Pacific or whatever, and they put AI into it and they they had and they used the mapping and the information and they were able to find where they should drill far better than all these engineers that they were using. So it's definitely changing. What role do companies do you think have in terms of changing the future for our children? Because we've both got children and, and the future for them is what role can we play yeah. in changing that for them? I think companies have the the lion's share of that responsibility. I get frustrated oftentimes when people are like, yeah, but the government, the government, it's true. You know, I think governments should drive policy and corporate South Africa, corporate Africa, we need to take the mantle on around job creation, upskilling and reskilling, creating new avenues of growth that contribute into the fiscus more meaningfully. That's, the private sector can do that super successfully. Yeah. And and it is that sense, right, that what role could we play in terms of sustainability? Because we are waiting for government to mm. almost catch up a little bit with legislation. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, how can companies play a role, do you think? Yeah. Is it in terms of their planning, their strategy? or You know, what is it? I mean, if I look at some organizations, I know strategy is a big thing for you. I think of strategy like five years out. Um, that's my personal thought. But but I understand okay. that things are changing. And okay. strategies are changing more quarterly, annually, in line okay. with that. So what can companies do as part of their strategy to improve their sustainability, do you think? What, what are some of the, the things that, that, how they can contribute? I think we have to envelop it into the way that we do business. And like not not just say that, it has to be fundamentally defining how we do business. 
I think it's tough for financial services companies because we don't sell things. Like we don't sell widgets, so you can't say it's been responsibly sourced or be recycled materials, etc. But we can definitely have a huge impact in terms of the industries that we support, in terms of lobbying, particularly institutional investors on our side. We can do a lot uh, in terms of climate change, environmental change, and that sort of stuff. There's a lot that we can do. Yeah, and investing in these startups and these new technology companies as well. Sorry, I lost you there. Yeah. No, so, and investing in these startups and new technology companies as well, supporting these entrepreneurs with the solutions to the cap- the challenges that we face as well. Is, is it is it that so it's one side is policy, the other well, side is programs, but it's investment as well. Advocacy. And advocacy, you know, we need to talk. We need to talk more actively about it and not talk and say, oh, here's what we've done. We've reduced, we've committed to net zero by 2030. Those things are important. I'm not saying they're not important, but I think a level of advocacy from from large corporates around why it's important for us to do this. Like, um, and and it's not just for altruistic reasons. It is it, there's a part of that, but for the sustainability of businesses and countries and continents, we just have to and we have to get it right. So we have to invest. We we have to create the right level of dialogue about it. So I'm really grateful for your time, and I understand you, you're you're very busy, but. The one thing with being businesswoman of the year, that's obviously a, a great accolade. And with your your vast sort of reading knowledge, one wonders when the book's coming out. <laughs> oh, Ralph. Oh, geez. No, I've never thought of that. <laughs> Maybe a podcast. <laughs> a podcast. So I suppose the next question would be, who would be, who'd be your, your first podcast guest? Jeff Emmelt. <laughs> Jeff Emmelt. Okay. I love that story. Like it, it impacted me so much as a leader. I, I honestly, when I finished that book, I asked myself, what would I have done? With 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 everything I know now, what would I have done differently? Yes, there are things. But but leadership is about that. Like there's this great quote um by Marcus Buckingham that talks about the role of a leader. And he says something like, as a leader, you should be agitated for change. And, and because you can see and you can visualize the future, it's so clear to you, getting there and getting there quickly should be the thing that drives you. Mm. Um, and so that's what I loved about that story. Like he he was fearless, he failed um, and he acknowledges mm. I failed, um, mm. but he was fearless in his approach. He was resolute, he was determined and he's sharing his learnings with other leaders. He's like, don't make the same mistakes I did. Um, mm. He would definitely be definitely be a guest. I that book had a had a real impact on me as a leader. Is that is that one thing that leaders need to be careful of? Is is always looking at the success and not learning from the it, not learn because there's so much to be learned from failures, even more than successes. I find, and that's why the comfort in not knowing helps. I think, uh, Ralph, it's what it's what's helped me. Like I don't have. I don't have a level of ego about these things because I also realize I don't know. <laughs> so I have to rely on people who know better than me. And my role is just to guide and lead them. It's to clear the way, it's to remove the hassles, um, is to drive them forward and let them do the best work that they can. Um, and so, yeah, I think you know, I'm thinking about the book and the podcast and stuff like that. You know, at a time, um, I'm super passionate about leadership and about growing the next set of leaders and sharing powerful stories with each other. All of us have a powerful story to tell, sometimes in the least obvious places, but you learn from those things and you learn from your failures way more than all the great things that you might have done. So being open about sharing those and helping people like um, go on their own leadership journey um, is definitely a passion. i got to think about how I do that. Wow. It was amazing to talk to you. We're super, super grateful. And once again, congratulations for last year and, and your success and your promotions and your new roles. And uh, we're super proud, honestly, to to have you as one of our winners. So congratulations. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for the conversation. It's, yeah, it's, always, it's, it's awesome to reflect. It's great to take time to reflect. So thank you for that. Pleasure. Thank you.